and welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I'm Guy Trijay Shankar, one of the general pediatricians here at ETSU, and we are really honored to have Dr. Sakib Lakhani here giving us this talk today. I'm going to start off by uh, with a few reminders and a few housekeeping issues, and then Dr. Jennifer Jane, one of our chief residents, starting July 1, is going to be um, introducing Dr. Lakhani. Um, just a reminder, please, please use the number in the back of the room to call in and use that event ID number. We count our numbers based on who's called in, so we do need that. Even if you don't need CME, please use that to uh, call in to the event. Also, please turn in your evaluations at the end of the session because, again, that's something that's used to keep our grand rounds going. I know we've had a good year with some fantastic that in the fall. Today is really our last grand round session for this academic year. Um, usually we have them every other Thursday and the end of the month um, is close to the time when all of our seniors are already graduating and leaving and so we decided to move it to today instead of at the end of the month um, in order for everybody to be able to be here and appreciate it. Um, traditionally we start back up again in the fall uh, not July 1, but start up again in September to give time for our incoming class to come in and get adjusted. And so uh, we will see you all again in the fall. Please, please turn in your evaluations. And Dr. James. All right. So I think most of you guys have either met and or worked with Dr. Lakani. Um, he has helped us out tremendously in the last year or so um, doing locums coverage in our PICU uh, to give Dr. Lucas a little bit of a break. But just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Lakani, um, he comes to us from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where he's an associate professor at the School of Medicine there, um, and a PICU attending at Sanford Children's Hospital, which if you haven't seen it, looks like a castle. It's a pretty great looking hospital. Um, so again, he has covered here several times, and we've all learned a lot of stuff from him. He's been wonderful. Um, he did his fellowship at Yale and um, med school at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and um, also did a fellowship, which I didn't know, in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, so this is wonderful to have him here helping us out and to give us a lecture, and hope you guys will welcome him. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for having me uh, here today. So, so I, I have a, um, you know, through some of the work that I've done, both in the ICU, also in integrative medicine, and, and uh, in a variety of sort of personal factors, I have a lot of interest in nutrition. And so one of, one of the things that, uh, nutrition in general, and I'm kind of the, the, the go-to source for a lot of stuff, particularly in the hospital. And so a lot of people ask me, uh, since there's a lot, of, um, a lot of information in the news today and also in the medical literature about vitamin D, I always get this question, so what's the deal with vitamin D? Right? So what are we doing? So that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, a bit today. And what I'm gonna do is to kind of, kind of run, a, run, a, run a gamut of things, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in just a second. This is my disclosure, nothing to disclose. I have no financial issues. I wish I did. <laughs> right. So, so I'm going to talk a little yeah. bit about uh, vitamin D metabolism and, and various physiologic effects. Uh, I'm going to talk some about modulators of vitamin D effects, like uh, the things that can affect uh, uh, what it actually does and has relevance and impact, I think, on, on how we manage uh, patients with vitamin D deficiency. And I'll talk a little bit some practical aspects of testing, blood levels, and, and sources of vitamin D, and vitamin D. And I'm going to do, do this a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk some about basic science. Uh, there, there will be slides with some diagrams and mechanistic pathways on it. But I think that's important to understand because it, it's, it sheds some light on, on what we're actually doing with vitamin D. And I'll, I'll mention some of the clinical research as well that's, uh, that's ongoing. So I'll start with a clinical vignette. And probably those of you who are a little bit older, uh, maybe more familiar with uh, patients like this. Don't see it as much uh, anymore. You see a lot more common. But all right, so you have a six-month-old boy presents the emergency department with seizures, previously healthy, no issues, um, Asian, breastfed, not re receiving vitamin D supplementation. And you know, this is less common nowadays. It used to be a lot more, uh, a lot more prevalent with kids like this. Mm -hmm. If we have to move your mic up a little bit, we don't hear you. Better. Sorry. Let's see. Is that better? Oh, wait a second. There we go. Maybe I should turn it on. All right. 
Okay, so a six-month-old boy's uh, seizing, and you know, as, as a typical evaluation for seizures, you get uh, electrolyte levels, and there's uh, serum calcium is 5.5, uh, ionized calcium is 0.85. Those are both significantly low, and there's a presumed diagnosis of vitamin D deficiency leading to hypercalcemic seizures, and of course, the risk factors being, um, you know, the mother being Asian, presumably a little bit darker skin, breastfeeding, and and uh, neither mom nor baby having vitamin D supplementation, right? And if you look at the 25 hydroxy vitamin D level, which is available the following day, um, it's 8 nanograms per ml, right? And the normal, and I have some question marks there, and we'll talk a little bit about this, normal somewhere 30 to 60 or less, depending on who you ask. All right, so, and, and, and these kids end up in the pediatric ICU often, uh, pediatric ICU admission, they get IV calcium, vitamin D administration, neurologic cardiovascular monitoring. Bone x-rays, um, even at that uh, age, can have early sign of, signs of rickets because these, um, you know, these patients have been in utero, probably from in, in utero into at least early childhood, have been deficient of, uh, of appropriate calcium. And so this uh, baby goes home with vitamin D and calcium supplementation, which is also recommended for the mother because the deficiency starts there. Right? Okay, so, so what do we know about vitamin D? Right, that's just an introduction there. So, so we know vitamin D is, is crucially important for bone and calcium metabolism, right? So it increases intestinal absorption of calcium, uh, increases renal and calcium absorption as well, and then it induces uh, bone resorption by, uh, by osteoclasts. And, and in, con in conjunction with uh, other hormones, parathyroid hormone particularly, but, but also others, it, uh, it achieves calcium phosphorus homeostasis and then allows for appropriate bone mineralization. So this is the sort of the classic view of, of vitamin D. But we've, we're starting to realize that that's not all. And, and I have right under here, it says vitamin D receptors are expressed in most cells. There's, there's very few cells that have been found that actually don't express vitamin D receptors. So we're getting a sense that it has a much wider role than, than, the, uh, than the classic um, uh, bone metabolism role that we know of. And, and there's evidence, and, and, and these are just some of the things, some of the more prominent things in cardiovascular, um, it, it actually, vitamin D controls, um, helps control blood pressure via the renin angiotensin axis. Um, so it's important in, in CHF, hypertension. Um, and there's, it's important for immune system. It helps in regulation of T cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, monocytes. So it's important, has an important role in infectious diseases, uh, inflammatory diseases, allergy, autoimmune. So all these immune regulated uh, type diseases. In the brain, it's important for development and maintenance of neurons. So it's thought that vitamin D may have a role in dementia, schizophrenia, seizures, right, independent of the calcium metabolism that's uh, going on. And uh, vitamin D is also important for uh, in, in, <clears throat> in cancer. So in the tumor microenvironment, it inhibits proliferation, angiogenesis, and it actually promotes different cellular differentiation. So it helps to, to counter um, uh, some of the uh, derangements that happen in cancer. And so, you know, there's a, there's a huge variety here. And what I'm going to focus on, because um, my background is, I've done, is, is in immunology, and, and this has a lot of relevance to the ICU as well, and I'll show you what I mean in just a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the evidence for vitamin D um, uh, function in immune cells. So just a, just a little bit about the vitamin D receptor. So it's a, a ubiquitous member of the nuclear receptor superfamily. So, so remember, vitamin D is a steroid hormone. So this is like a steroid hormone receptor. So vitamin D will, will actually binds to a vitamin D binding protein that helps um, transport uh, vitamin D to target cells, makes it bioavailable, and then it combines with the vitamin D receptor that then um, translocates to the nucleus and binds to vitamin D response elements uh, on DNA, and then it controls protein transcription, right? So vitamin D is, is, is functioning by, by, uh, by uh, uh, by controlling protein transcription. And there's, there's thought to be, right now, as, as we look at the vitamin D receptor and where we see vitamin D um, response elements on, on DNA, uh, vitamin D is thought to be, um, have three primary gene targets, and that's cellular metabolism, um, growth and differentiation, and immunity. And these are, these are three, three main things. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the immunity stuff. And, and, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, you know, people always ask me about, well, vitamin D, you know, there's, a, there's studies that, that show, that talk about vitamin D being important for all these things, and a lot of people, they are, a lot of them are association studies. So they say, you know, vit low vitamin D levels are associated with X, or they're associated with, you know, asthma, or they might be associated with development of tumors or poor outcomes. But what I want to try to show you here is that there's actually, it's not simply, even though there's, right now the clinical studies, many of them are association studies and they don't show causation, but there is 
uh, evidence from a mechanistic standpoint to suggest very much that vitamin D has, has, a, has a role in these things. And that's what I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. So this is a classic pathway of vitamin D metabolism. And does this, um, does it have a pointer on this? It's the it's long green button. On the top? Perfect. Okay, great. So this is the classic pathway of vitamin D metabolism, right? So you can get, really the main source of vitamin D is, is um, transformation from 70 hydro uh, uh, cholesterol to uh, vitamin D3, right? And you can also get some supplements have this, some, some fish will have uh, vitamin D3, but really the main source is sunlight. And you can also get vitamin D2, which is also potentially bioactive, and this is in, in plants, plant sources of vitamin D and also some supplements. But either way, and these, these enzymes, these are in light blue, all these, these are um, the, the uh, CYP enzymes or the cytochrome P450 enzymes, right? And, and, and these are the ones that are primary, uh, primarily in, uh, responsible for uh, metabolism and activation, activation and metabolism of vitamin D. So you get vitamin D3, let's say you get it from the sun or from whatever supplements you get, and then you get, that's the 25, uh, and, and then it gets activated in the liver, and you end up with 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And this is, this is the, the uh, storage amount. This is sort of your supply of vitamin D. It's not the active form, which is the 125 dihydroxy, but this is sort of the uh, supply form. And then uh, there's a CYP27B1, which is a hydroxylase that sticks another, the second hydroxyl group on, and that's when you get active forms of, uh, um, of uh, vitamin D. And then this then binds to the vitamin D receptor, and you get your physiologic effects from it. There's also a couple of other um, hydroxylate enzymes that, that put a hydroxyl group on the 24 um, uh, position, and that ends up uh, leading to excretion of these forms. So that's how vitamin D is sort of, the, the levels are sort of maintained so you don't get too high or, or, or too low. Now, this is pretty finely tuned, and really the, the, the main thing that's, uh, that, uh, that's controlling it is parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone promotes this conversion uh, from the storage form of vitamin D to the activated form of vitamin D. And you can see, and I'm just going to show you a couple ways that this is regulated, there's a nice negative feedback loop to, to regulate this. So uh, vitamin, the 25, the, the dihydroxy form actually inhibits parathyroid secretion, so if, as you start accumulating, you, you, you shut down this pathway. Um, it also directly inhibits the enzyme as well, the conversion enzyme, so there's a more negative feedback. Um, and there's a there's a protein called FGF23 that's that inhibits this and, and vitamin the dihydroxy uh, um, uh, form um, activates FGF23. So again, you have more negative feedback. And then the other thing that it does is the the 125 dihydroxy actually activates these um, these enzymes that stick the 24 hydroxy group, and then you downregulate and and get rid of vitamin and, um, and get rid of vitamin D. So that, that you don't have so it's a nicely, nicely tuned uh, regulatory system here. Right. Now, this is looking at vitamin D metabolism in macrophages. And macrophages, like most cells, right, so we're talking about the immune system now, macrophages, like most cells, have vitamin D receptors, right? And that's why people think vitamin D is important in a variety of uh, events. And so the interesting thing is, so everything else applies, right? You still get your vitamin D here, and you get your 25-hydroxy vitamin D. But all this feedback regulation that exists in sort of the classical vitamin D pathways absent in macrophages, right? So you don't have any of that feedback regulation. And in fact, these excretion enzymes are absent in vitamin D. So there's no way to get rid of, um, get rid of that uh, vitamin D once it's activated. So once, it's act once, once you have the active form of vitamin D, you want that macrophage to do whatever it's doing really without, uh, without much down regulation at that point. So what is it that controls the activation of vitamin D in macrophages? Well, it's actually controlled by cytokines, interestingly enough. So if you have, and the cytokines are uh, particularly TNF alpha, interferon gamma, IL-1 beta. So th these are cytokines that are activated when you have an acute infection, right? And it also can be stimulated by um, LPS and TLR, and these are toll-like receptors, and these are uh, very important for the innate immune system. So you can imagine you have a stimulus. Uh, like some sort of infection, you have activation of the immune system, you get excretion, secretion of cytokines, and then you get um, activation of vitamin D um, in response to this. So what does this actually do in, um, in macrophages? Right? We know vitamin D is important for calcium metabolism in, in the classical pathway, but in, in macrophages, it's actually the physiological effects, and I, I don't know if you can see it down here, it's, it's actually responsible for the production of bactericidal peptides. Right? And in fact, if you don't have vitamin D, 
if you don't have enough vitamin D in your macrophages, you actually, some of these are entirely dependent on vitamin D secretion. So these are things like beta defensins, thelocytin, uh, so things that are going to help the macrophage attack bat bacteria. So this is a very, very, you know, again, strong basic science evidence that vitamin D is, is important in immunity, separate, completely separate from its role in calcium metabolism, right? So in innate immunity, um, the uh, CYP27 is upregulated, again, just to highlight what I, what I just showed you, is upregulated by cytokines and TMR receptors on macrophages and monocytes, and the activation of uh, the vitamin D receptor um, uh, leads to induction of bactericidal peptides. And it's also important, so this is the innate immune system, and the adaptive immune system is also important for the activation of regulatory T cells, right? And these are T cells that help sort of determine what kind of immune response you're going to have, how strong your immune response is going to have. Um, they play a role in um, uh, Th1 versus Th2 responses, so allergy and, and autoimmune uh, and, and diseases as well. So, so, so again, these are, these are potentially very important. Um, it can also suppress the Th1 response, maybe give you more of a, a, a Th2 type, type response as well, too. So these are, these are a variety of effects. So, so let's move from, so this is basic science looking in, 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 a, in a cellular isolation. Um, and so we're going to move from macrophages to look at uh, an, an animal system. And uh, mice have, you know, you know, somewhat of a studyable immune system that's similar to humans. So we look at um, vitamin D receptor and the um, hydroxylase CYP, CYP27B1 knockout mice. So you basically either remove the vitamin D receptor from these mice or you remove the hydroxylase enzyme from the mice and what actually happens. So these mice have increased susceptibility to a variety of autoimmune diseases, right? Such as inflammatory bowel disease, um, type one uh, diabetes, and this is EAE, it's, it's uh, called inflammatory autoimmune encephalitis. It's a model for multiple sclerosis, right? So these are, um, uh, autoimmune type diseases. And they also have an increased risk for a variety of cancers, right? And, and the interesting thing is that it, it notes susceptibility in this disease models not spontaneous. So it doesn't mean if you knock these things out of these animals, they actually don't spontaneously generate tumors, right? But if you give them something like chemicals or, or some sort of exposure that will lead to tumor formation, um, they're going to get the tumors much more frequently than regular wild-type mice. Same thing with the autoimmune disease. It's not like they spontaneously develop type 1 diabetes, but if you put them in a system where they could potentially develop type 1 diabetes, they're going to develop it much more than the wild-type mice. Right? So it shows that you know, vitamin D, it's not like the key factor, but it's a very important modulating factor in a variety of these, uh, variety of these conditions. Okay, now we move from mice to humans, right? And there's a couple of um, uh, related uh, diseases in humans, right? Vitamin D-dependent rickets. And there's two types, right? Type 1 is a mutation in the CYP27B1, the hydroxylase enzyme. And these patients present with rickets, but they respond to re treatment with calcitriol. So remember, they, do, they just can't go from 25-hydroxy to the 125-dihydroxy. So if you give them 125-dihydroxy, they're fine. Right, everything else works works well, so these patients re respond well. They're 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 pretty easy. It's a, it's a nice uh, finding, and they're relatively easy to treat. But the type two, they have a mutation in the vitamin D receptor, right? And so remember, this has you know this has a lot of implications downstream, depending on you know what what cell well, what cell type and what context that you're using it. And and these patients, they tend to have rickets, and they also have alopecia as well. And they're very difficult to treat. Um, it's variable and based on the exact mutation that they have. They, some of them do respond to high doses of vitamin D and or calcium. They're, 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 they have derangements in calcium metabolism pretty significantly. So, but some of them you can, this is the standard treatment. You try to use high dose vitamin D and calcium and some of them respond. Um, the treatment re tends to remove the rachitic phenotype uh, but not the alopecia. So there's something else going on with the alopecia that's probably, that maybe it may be immune related, has nothing to do with calcium, well, we don't really know. Um, and there are reports of immune dysfunction with some of these patients, right? And so here's, here's a case report. This is a, a while back. Um, but a boy who had a dysfunctional vitamin D receptor and, and forward rickets had an older sister who died at 20 months from pneumonia. And um, this kid uh, failed treatment with vitamin D but responded to daily calcium and infusions, right? So he was able to maintain at least some sort of calcium homeostasis. But he also had multiple episodes of gram-negative septicemia. And, and uh, during episodes, you'd have high level of IgM to, uh, to LPS, right, which is on, found on the surface of gram-negative bacteria, uh, but IgG was never detectable. So he could never amount, um, amount an appropriate uh, immune response. And remember, 
um, antibody production has to do with both B cells that are producing the antibodies, but then also the T cells that are regulating the action of the of the B cells. So you know it's not clear in this patient what, what exactly it was, but it could be any one of those. And he also has impaired neutrophil chemotactus. And again, neutrophils are important for important for that innate immune response. And he died at seven years of age um, from um, uh, from pneumonia. Okay. So so again, the, the, this is you know pretty plausible mechanistic. Um, information and how vitamin D is important for immune system function. So I'm an I'm a ICU doc, so I'm interested in, you know, what role does, you know, vitamin D have to do in, in an ICU? And there's been actually a number of studies uh, lately. This is one from last year that I'll just kind of walk you through as an example. So this is in critical care medicine uh, last January. So about, uh, you know, 3,300 adults from two academic ICUs, and they actually had pre-admission vitamin D levels for all these patients. So it's kind of interesting. You know, there's a lot of places, and we'll talk some about screening for vitamin D deficiency and, um, and, and levels. So they actually knew ahead of time their, um, uh, their vitamin D levels. And they placed them in three categories. Uh, they called deficient, which was less than 15 nanograms per ml, um, and, and there was about... Uh, about 15% of them fell in that category. Insufficient, which is that 15 to 30 nanograms per ml, and about 1,300 there, and sufficient, which were greater than 30 nanograms per ml. And that was about 1,500 patients. And the primary endpoint that they looked at, so these were critical care admissions um, for, for a variety of reasons, and they looked at sepsis, right? So the occurrence of sepsis either three days prior um, up to seven days after critical care initi initiation. So these were may have been patients who were admitted for sepsis, so they had a diagnosis of sepsis and they were transferred to the ICU, you know, they started a few days before, or they were admitted for something else, and then they developed sepsis as well um, after that. And they found that the odds ratio of sepsis, right, and, and this is in comparison so to the sufficient group. So you take the vitamin D sufficient group and you compare it to the deficient group. The deficient group had a 1.6, they, they had... Um, incidence of sepsis that was 1.6 um, times the sufficient group, and the insufficient group, which were a little bit higher vitamin D level, they had a 1.2 um, uh, times the incidence of sepsis as well. And if you use vitamin D as a continuous variable, so as you sort of look at it, that every 5 nanogram per ml increase in vitamin D decreased the risk of sepsis in these patients by 4%. Right? And if you compare vitamin D levels that are less than 30 and greater, greater than 30, the odds ratio for 90-day mortality was 1.41, um, and the adjusted and, and if you adjusted that for multi, you know, various multivariables, the odds ratio actually increased to 1.6. Right? So this is a you know a, a, a adult cohort, um, and there's similar studies that are coming out in, in, in pediatrics and also uh, you know multiple. There's there's not a lot that have the great vitamin D pre-admission data like, like, like this, but there are, there are some coming out um, yeah, like that. So, so again, so that's starting from beginning to end. We have a, you know, a cellular mechanism, basic science, looking at animal models, and then also into humans uh, through um, uh, gene mutations, and then in a clinical study showing that it seems like vitamin D is important for the uh, immune system and, and its regulation. So this raises the question, should we be supplementing? Right? Now, there, there's two ways to look at this, and I'll, I'll address right here the issue, so sh should we be supplementing acutely? Right? I, 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 the way I view this, and, and, and this is just me personally, so there, there are people who will debate this, I sort of think of it as that vitamin D is more of a maintenance type hormone. Right? It helps prevent these kinds of things. So supplementation in cases of acute illness may not be helpful. For example, if you think of an inflammatory cascade, right, it's much easier to stop it from happening right, than it is to try to get it under control once it's been initiated. And if you, look, if, if you, if you, if you see this, that vitamin D deficiency and, and you know, sepsis is often involved, is, involves particularly when they get um, you know, from the florid sepsis and they get a lot of in, in inflammatory, patients get a significant inflammatory response, that, that, um, that that's often what leads to the trouble that you get, both from a you know, uh, human dynamic standpoint and a respiratory standpoint. So if you can keep it under control and prevent, prevent it from being initiated, that you can have an appropriate immune, immune response, that you can appropriately uh, manage the bacteria and prevent that significant inflam inflammation, I think you're better off. So I, I think of it that way, that, that, vitamin, that if you have appropriate vitamin D levels, you can sort of prevent that uh, severe type um, uh, sepsis uh, uh, type, uh, type reaction.
acutely, it may or may not be helpful. And the other thing is, again, this is, this is a steroid type hormone. So remember, we know in asthma, right, when you give steroids, they're not going to have their effect right away. It takes time because it has to, you're, you're controlling gene transcription. So you have to have time for the steroid to get in there, to bind to the receptor, to go through the nucleus, to regulate gene expression, and then to have that gene expression come out into proteins and then for those proteins to have effect. And right, we, we always talk about in, in asthma, well, it takes about six hours or so for steroids, and that's why it's a big process. And same thing with vitamin D, you're, you're controlling gene regulation. So if, if you've already had something started, it may not be, be useful to have it done in acute. But it, it does raise the importance of baseline vitamin D status, right? And so then this, this raises the question, really, should we be supplementing on a sort of a, a, a you know, chronic regulated, um, on, on, a, uh, on, on a chronic standpoint. And before I answer this, I'm going to give you a couple of, uh, uh, look at it a couple of different ways, right? So first of all, here's another clinical vignette, 35-year-old uh, Asian male, chronic leg cramps, right? Especially after vigorous exercise, has frequent sun exposure, uh, normal electrolytes, and a vitamin D level of 22. Um, uh, got vitamin D supplementation and symptoms resolved. Sufficient levels about uh, about 40. And this is actually me. This is one of the this is uh, one of the ways I got uh, first started getting in, um, interested in in, in, uh, in vitamin D. Actually made a big difference in, in in what I was able to do. So even though my calcium levels were fine and stuff, I had uh, significant leg cramps and, and they went away. And I, I've actually s since met a number of uh, people, particularly dark darker skinned individuals, um, who have. Uh, exact same, especially those ca calf cramps, um, and uh, with vitamin D supplementation, it's always always gone away. So testing. So how do you test? Uh, this is an important point. And the insurance coverage has gotten kind of, in, and those of you who are in primary care probably understand this even better than I do. But it's gotten a little dicey, right? Sometimes it can be an issue. Sometimes they say you can only cover it if the deficiency is already diagnosed, but you can't get it to diagnose the deficiency. So it's kind of. I don't know how you deal with that. In the hospital, we don't have to deal with that, so you can just get vitamin D levels in your body. Um, and remember, the 25-hydroxy level is best for measuring stores. Um, the active form is often maintained until the deficiency gets extremely severe. So there's really not, not a whole lot of point in, in measuring unless you're looking for something specifically there. All right, so what is an adequate level? And there's a lot of debate about this. The um, Institute of Medicine uh, says a level greater than uh, 16 nanograms per ml is, great, is sufficient for 50% of the population. Uh, greater than 20 is sufficient for 97.5% you know, of the population, and greater than 50 you have concern for toxicity. Right? That's the Institute of Medicine. The Endocrine Society um, has a, a definitely a different view on it. They say um, insufficiency is 20 to 29, deficiency is less than 20. So they say you ought to be 30 or above. Um, and, and they actually, I, I have a slide that later on says, they basically said not really much concern for toxicity until you hit 100 or 150. So they're a little bit more uh, generous with, uh, with the vitamin D levels. Um, Michael Hollick, he's sort of the, the he's, he's very pro-vitamin D, but he's sort of considered the vitamin D guru. He's up at Boston University. Um, he recommends vitamin D levels somewhere between the 30 to 60 range as, as sort of good and adequate for most people. And I think that's probably, that's, that's sort of what I keep in my mind. I, I, I think that's a pretty reasonable, uh, pretty reasonable level. All right, so the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, depending on the definitions that you use, it can be estimates between 25 to 100% of the population. So it obviously depends on what range you lose. But either way, it's a pretty significant number. The, um, any, uh, this uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, there's actually, it's a, it has a lot of really interesting data that comes out of it. It's, it's survey data, so you take it with a little bit of grain of salt, but, but it does have a lot of good information. But uh, this is 2005, 2006, it runs there may be one a little bit more recent, but it runs a little bit behind just because of the, uh, the survey data nature. But the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in the U.S. population amongst this survey, overall 41 percent, blacks 82 percent, Hispanics 70 percent, right? So pretty, pretty, pretty prevalent. Here, here's an interesting graph, and this looks at um, vitamin D levels are here on the x-axis, and the percent of the group um, is, 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 uh, is here on the, on the, on the y-axis. But if you look at um, um, the, these are these are our traditionally living dark-skinned individuals in equatorial Africa, right? So you can see there's a range of vitamin D uh, vitamin D levels over here, and the mean, their mean vitamin D level is actually 46, right? And then if you take um, um, non-Hispanic blacks in the U.S., you can see they're way over here, and their mean vitamin D level is 15. 
So pretty significantly different from you know their you know where their ancestral group would be. And then if you look at uh, U.S. Mexican Americans, they're about by many level of mean is about 20, and uh, non-Hispanic whites are about uh, 25. Right. So you can see here's a here's a vitamin D. You know, it's well into 40, it's 46, and that's just the mean. I kind of find it hard to believe. You know, when the Institute of Medicine says a vitamin D level of 50 gives you concern for toxicity, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Although there are racial and ethnic differences, and I'll, I'll mention that, that briefly. So I, I don't I don't know if that um, if that maybe the um, endocrine society you know 100 to 150 may be a little bit too high, but it, it's hard for me to think that 50 is, is so bad. But you can see there's half of them are well up here into the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, and presumably okay. These are all presumably healthy people. Do you think it's change in lifestyles? Or? Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where, where does it come from, right? You know, in essence, vitamin D comes from the sun, right? So if you're low in vitamin D, you have a deficiency in sun exposure. That's sort of the bottom line. Are there foods, are there ways you can get in your diet? Yes, there are, right? So fortified milk, right? So I get added vitamin D to it, fortified cereal. And you can see 40 IUs, 120 IUs, not a whole lot, right? Fortified. Here's an egg yolk. Right, orange juice is fortified with it. Salmon, um, and this is wild caught salmon, um, has about you know 800 IUs plus or minus. So that's not a bad source. So if you're eating salmon about every day, you can meet your vitamin D um, you know, requirements. So it's fine. So where should you get it from? Uh, this is this is uh, data from Holly. Essentially, it shows that if you're taking a thousand IU pill, right, you you get your vitamin D. Uh, on a daily basis, you get your vitamin D level up to about 30. If you get a little bit of sun exposure, you can get it up well up into 40s, 50s, 60s, right? Sun is efficient. That's the way we are designed to get appropriate levels of vitamin D, right? So what are the risk factors for a deficiency? Lack of sun exposure, again. So what are the things that lead to it, right? Sunscreen, a sun exposure, avoidance of sun exposure, indoor lifestyle, right? Location, distance from equator and the season. So, and then this, I'll, I'll mention this briefly. Uh, as well, right? The farther you are, the angle of the sun is going to change, and you're going to get less sun exposure this season, right? I'm, um, you know, I'm in South Dakota in these days, and if you blink too long, you miss daylight <laughs> in, the, in the winter. I mean, it's it's pretty significant, right? Skin pigmentation that definitely plays a role, right? Dark-skinned individuals, we, we're we're much more likely to be vitamin D deficient. It's because we don't have uh, we have essentially UV filters. Right? Lighter skinned individuals more likely to get a little bit burned, but maintain adequate vitamin D levels. And clothing choices, right? Religious, cultural reasons, people who are going to wear longer clothing and in essence are going to get less sun exposure. Uh, obesity, right? So vitamin D is part of the ADEC, right? It's fat soluble. So if you have more fat, you're going to, have, you're going to need to have higher vitamin D, um, absolute amount of, a, a larger absolute amount of vitamin D because a lot of it's going to get distributed to, to wider areas. Age, the older you get, the harder it is for you to appropriately metabolize vitamin D. Malabsorption, right? So if you have any sort of malabsorption type syndrome, celiac, Crohn's, et cetera, et cetera, you're, you're, you'll need higher levels of vitamin D. And breastfeeding infants, of course, and it's nice, it, it, a lot of people are really happy to see the AAP finally recommending that all breastfed infants should get uh, vitamin D supplementations. You still see pediatricians that don't do it, though. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's a Okay, so what level of sun exposure? And this is part of the lifestyle and cultural change, right? And, right, it's been beaten into us that we have to avoid, right, you gotta get the sunscreen on and you have to avoid uh, sun exposure. And the American Academy of Dermatologists actually states in their official statement that there is no safe level of UV irradiation and therefore they're, they, they're, the American Academy of Dermatologists recommends no unexpected, un, unprotected sun exposure, absolutely zero, right? So, sun exposure and cancer, right, this is, this is a concern, right? what, what are, what's actually the data in it? Um, there, there definitely is damaging effects of sun exposure from UV, irradi UV radiation. Um, there's basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas are highly linked to sun exposure, although they typically are very low grade, right? And there is a dose response here, right? So there is a, there is a reasonable level you can do. Melanoma, which is actually what they use you know, say, you know, that's always sort of the big bugaboo, right? We talk about melanoma, melanoma, higher risk for melanoma. But the, 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 the data, um, you know, and melanoma is malignant and it tends to be bad when it's, uh, when it's caught. Um, but recent data really suggests that burning is really what leads to increased skin cancer risk. And that data is pretty strong now, 
it's, it's actually getting stronger and stronger. So it's not simply sun exposure. And in fact, short periods of burning are likely to be more detrimental than pro even prolonged modest sun exposure, such as occupational exposure. And in fact, lifetime sun exposure at low levels, they're actually protective against melanoma formation. Right? So, so and, and the interesting thing is, you know, a lot of melanoma, uh, you know what they don't talk about, a lot of it actually occurs in sun protected areas, like uh, under clothes and, and, and so forth. So really, it doesn't really stack up. That, you know, there's, certainly if you're getting, if you're, if you're going out, if you're going to tanning salon, salon and getting, if you're going out and getting burned multiple times and getting bad sunburns, that is going to increase your risk. But just simple sun exposure to a modest level, it's not, not so bad. Right? And there's also a lot of beneficial uh, effects of sun exposure. Vitamin D production, of course, is one. And there's a, a several other vitamin D independent effects. Right? There's, it actually uh, can help with mood regulation via endorphin production. Nitric oxide production can help cardiovas uh, cardiovascular health. Uh, the regulation of melatonin, circadian rhythms, and sleep. Right? You, you actually, you know, a lot of people, the incidence of sleep disorders is actually very high, uh, particularly in, in, in Western nations. And a lot of it is it probably uh, has to do with um, the lack of sun exposure because that UV is important for triggering and, uh, and controlling your circadian rhythms. There's actually local anti-inflammatory effects in skin, and we talked about uh, pr protection from an increased survival in melanoma with sort of that low level of, of uh, lifetime sun exposure. And of course, you know, there's there's some information about um, physical, emotional, and, and psychological effects of uh, severely limited sun exposure <laughs> as well. So what level of sun exposure is appropriate? Hollick actually recommends what he calls sensible sun exposure, and that's um, our pro uh, exposure to the arms and legs, which is about 20 to 25% of the body surface area, approximately five to 15 minutes, three times a week. And it depends a lot on time of day, season, latitude, and skin pigmentation. So, you know, pretty modest. You go out for a little walk a few times a, a, few times a week, which is healthy enough for a variety of other reasons, and, and, and a lot of people can get appropriate sun exposure. Right. Does it apply to everybody? No. I mean, if you're dark skinned, you probably need longer than that. Right. And I get, I, I know, you know, I, I get a lot of sun exposure in the sun. I, in the summers, I spend a lot of time outside, and really almost as much time as I can. And my vitamin D levels do definitely drop. So I, I know I need more. The other thing is, you know, we talked about latitude. There's estimates that uh, that that roughly at about 35 degrees latitude, it is almost impossible just from the angle of the sun. If you live north of here, right, it's almost impossible for you to get enough sun exposure, um, just from a timing standpoint and from the angle of the sun to maintain vitamin, appropriate vitamin D levels throughout the year, right? Now, at certain times, obviously, in the summer you can do it, but in the winter, it's just not going to be possible, just from, from again, angle and, and possibilities of uh, UV exposure. So I'm up here in South Dakota, so that's not so great. I lived in Connecticut, I grew up in D.C., so I guess you all are right down here close to the zone, so almost possible. Some of you could, could potentially manage to do it. All right, and so where do you get your vitamin D from? If you're an Eskimo, you eat muktuk, which is raw blubber, and um, actually has high levels of vitamin D and vitamin C. So this is how they, they prevent uh, disease for them. If you're not an Eskimo, um, other dietary sources of vitamin D, we talked about salmon having, you know, maybe about 700 or so. Um, you, it's interesting, you can see wild caught salmon up to you know, 600 to 1,000 farm uh, salmon has a lot less vitamin D, it has a lot less of other nutrients as well, and that's another talk you can, uh, you can go into. Um, but but these, these sort of cold water uh, fish are actually really good, and this is why like cod liver oil as well. Cod liver oil typically will have good levels of vitamin D if anybody's mother used to give them cod liver oil. <laughs> about exposure to sunlight, right? And, and this is sort of a, that modest level of sunlight exposure can get your, can sort of be the equivalent of about 3,000 IUs, right? So a lot more. Uh, fortified milk, orange juice, and, and so forth, you're still 100, and, and not, a, not a whole lot. So how much do you actually need? And I apologize, it's probably a little, a little hard to see this. This is from the Institute of Medicine. And again, their, their estimates tend to be pretty conservative. There's people who, who, who think that it should be a lot more. But essentially, they're looking at, for vitamin D, they're saying um, that the, the RDA is, is about 600 or so for just about everybody. And maximum limits are, are somewhere between 1,000 to 4,000, depending on your, on your age. Okay, But they're sort of saying about 600 is an RDA. 
I, I personally think that that's too low. There's a lot of experts in the vitamin D field who, who feel that that's just that's too low for most people. For kids, that's probably all right. For, so for small infants getting you know the 400 IU drops, that's probably pretty appropriate. But for, for adults, this is especially if you're not getting appropriate uh, sunlight levels, this is going to be too low, and you're never going to correct or you're never going to achieve appropriate levels. Okay, so should we supplement? It would seem like from all this stuff we should. Let me throw out a couple of a couple of other things to think about. Um, before we, before we jump into this. Okay, so we talked about, and I showed this slide earlier, vitamin D is important for bone and calcium metabolism, right? It increases intestinal absorption of calcium, renal calcium absorption, and bone resorption by osteoclasts, right? So what's actually, so bone resorption by osteoclasts, and this used to always, uh, this puzzled me. So, so it seems like for these first two, you get calcium into the body, right? And then osteoclasts break down bone, right? In fact, it's important because in order to have healthy, healthy bone, you have to have that balance between bone production and breakdown, right? So you're actually constantly it's remodeling, in other words, right? You're constantly remodeling. But it doesn't seem like vitamin D actually is important. We don't have a lot of evidence that it's directly important for putting the calcium into the bones. It's resorption. So what, what, what's, what are some potential issues with this? Well, one is I'll talk a little bit about what, what we might know about this. And it's still not clear, right? We still don't know for sure how vitamin D, and, but we know that for sure, right? Because we know if you don't have enough, you get rickets. So clearly it's important for calcium deposition into the bone. But how that actually works is still not, still not fully clear. But the issue is if you have, so if you start increasing intestinal absorption of calcium, renal of calcium absorption, and you're going to have bone resorption, so you're going to actually have an increase in your serum calcium. And that's one of the things you can see, people who are vitamin D toxic, right, can get increase in serum calcium. And so what's the problem with that? Well, we worry about atherosclerosis, maybe kidney stones, right? You have uh, uh, your calcium pro product gets too high, you can potentially have kidney stones. But really sort of the big one that people really worry about is atherosclerosis. Basically, you know, malignant calcium deposition in places where it shouldn't be. And we know that, that, um, that, that you know, certainly if you have you know, inflamed, there, you know, there's a lot of debate really is what is actually causing atherosclerosis, but if you have inflamed arteries, that's a place where you can have calcium deposition. And this is potentially a problem. So let's look at a little bit about what we might know um, about how, how vitamin D affects, actually puts, puts uh, calcium into the bones. So this is a osteoblast, right? So unlike osteoclasts that break down bone, osteoblasts are responsible for building up bone. And osteoblasts produce two proteins. One osteocalcin and one matrix GLA protein. It has this GLA um, residue uh, that is uh, uh, carboxylated, and that becomes important in just a few minutes. So, what do these proteins do? They both get activated, and when they're activated, they promote bone formation and mineralization. Okay, so this seems like something that's interesting that we, that we need to, to look at. Now, vitamin D. We know that vitamin D can lead to an increased serum calcium, or, or I, I guess I should say an appropriate level of serum calcium if you're having appropriate amounts of vitamin D, right? Now, vitamin D actually can also stimulate osteoblasts to produce osteocalcin and matrix clot protein. So, aha, this kind, of, this kind of makes sense now, right? So you, have, you don't have a direct, necessarily a direct effect of vitamin D, but an indirect effect, you you, you trigger the osteoblast to produce osteocalcin and matrix clot protein, and these things are activated there. Now, and then they can use this increased serum calcium in order to get bone formation and mineralization. And that looks pretty nice, right? And the other interesting thing is that there's, other, there's a variety of other cells. Osteocalcin is actually only produced by osteoblasts. Right? That's the only place you find it. But other cells will actually produce this matrix clot protein. And when that gets activated, in addition to bone formation and mineralization, it also inhibits vascular and soft tissue calcification, right? So you actually get calcium going to the bone, which is where you want it, and you actually get it, in fact, even removed and not placed into um, arteries and other soft tissues. So this, again, this all sounds good. And now an interesting thing is, how are these proteins activated? They're actually activated by vitamin K2, right? And because these proteins require carboxylation, and we know that vitamin K, what does it do? It carboxylates, right? And in fact, K1, which is what we all know about, K1 is um, responsible for carboxylation of, of your um, coagulation proteins, and that's how you get appropriate coagulation. And in fact, if you don't have vitamin K, you can get, um, you know, can, babies can get um, 
you know, uh, uh, that um, coagulopathic, coagulopathic disease, but it's pretty rare in, in adults because vitamin K deficiency is, is very rare in adults. However, vitamin K2, which is a completely different um, isoform, is the only one that can activate these proteins and lead to bone formation and mineralization. So these two proteins, are, are, sorry, these two vitamins are working in concert with each other. But the interesting thing about, so vitamin K2 is also fat soluble. There's no reliable method to measure levels. And, and the surrogate measurement is activated osteocalcin. So if you look at this osteocalcin protein, vitamin D, if you have enough vitamin D, you'll have enough osteocalcin. But if it's not, if it's not, um, if you don't have enough vitamin K2, it won't be in the active form. It won't be in the carboxylated form. And so the assay, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go through all this again. So the assay for figuring out vitamin K2 levels is indirect. You're, you're looking at activated levels of osteocalcin. And the sources now are fairly limited. Okay, um, Diet is one, um, and these are only grass-fed meat. So it's got to be cows. And so where does the majority of meat come from these days? Feedlots, right? And they're eating grain, right? So if your grain-fed meat actually does not contain any vitamin K2, only grass-fed does. Um, eggs and dairy, and this is grass-fed eggs and dairy. Right, so dairy, where does most of the milk come from? Cows that are being fed grain, right? They have essentially no vitamin K2 in them, but if you have um, uh, uh, grass-fed milk or butter or ghee or you know, whatever you want to use, right? It actually has decent levels of vitamin K2. Certain fermented foods do. There's some Japanese fermented foods that, you know, and, and so forth. And certain intestinal bacteria, right? And limited quantities can also be converted from vitamin K1. Vitamin K1 is actually, you know, fairly prevalent in, in, in diet, and it's not unusual uh, to have enough of it. And there's a small percentage that can be converted to K2, but not a whole lot, right? And whereas K1 deficiency is rare, K2 deficiency actually appears to be quite common, right? So this is interesting. So if you go back to this and you say, okay, we have, let's say if you, even if you do, so you have somebody, let's say you have, you have adequate vitamin D levels, but you don't have enough vitamin K2, so you can't have activation of osteocalcin and make the clot protein, right? And therefore, you don't have the calcium <coughs> being put into bone and an inhibition of vascular and soft tissue calcification, but you still have this increased serum calcium from your vitamin D, and then you can get vascular and soft tissue calcification and atherosclerosis, right? So some considerations, right? So what happens if we supplement vitamin D in the face of vitamin K2 deficiency, right? And we don't know the answer to this, right? This is, this is a, some of this is, uh, really a lot of this is sort of basic science mechanism that's been, that's been worked out, but it seems to hold true. So not much, doesn't really make a difference, just supplement it and you'll be fine. Do we get, start getting metastatic calcification, right? Do we start getting atherosclerosis, increasing in risk of atherosclerosis? And how about other effects, right? Immune uh, system, cardiovascular and so forth that are reliant on vitamin D uh, effects. Could there be other things that are linked to K2, right? And there are actually clinical trials that are actually ongoing now that are looking at K2 supplementation for osteoporosis and, and a variety of other conditions as well. And then, you know, what about calcium supplementation, right? You know, there, for a long time we used to, particularly for osteoporosis, the, the recommendation used to be, you know, give calcium and give extra calcium. I, I personally think right now, and, and there's debate on this, so this is just a personal opinion, I think a lot of that was due to vitamin D deficiency. Right? And that actually most people can get appropriate levels of calcium, especially here in the West when you have a, a reasonable access to, to dairy and other things. Most people can get appropriate levels of, of, of calcium in their bone. But again, you know, what happens if you get calcium and vitamin D but you don't get the K2? I mean, are you going to be able to appropriately mineralize, mineralize your bones? And I don't think that question is not answered yet. Okay. And then here's an, one more thing to throw in before we address the supplementation. And how am I doing? Okay. Almost done. Um, so vitamin D binding protein. So remember I said vitamin D binds to the binding protein and then that takes it to the target cell and then you get the vitamin D receptor. There's actually, um, uh, there's known gene polymorphisms of, in the vitamin D binding protein that affect the binding affinity and possibly the bioavailability of vitamin D, right? And some of these are found, upon, there's population studies that are actually ongoing, large scale population studies looking at um, uh, cardiovascular uh, disease risk factors, um, particularly stroke and, and, and heart disease, and they're looking at uh, all sorts of um, uh, levels and stuff, but they're, they're actually looking at uh, vitamin D levels as well, and there are also some that are looking at the uh, gene polymorphisms of these vitamin D binding proteins. And it seems like, for instance, um, uh, dark-skinned individuals tend to have a, a, a form of uh, vitamin D binding protein that makes vitamin D less bioavailable, right? So 
in fact, and which makes sense, right? Because many dark skinned individuals are from an equatorial um, environment where they're getting tons of sun. So they don't need excess amounts of vitamin D. So they're okay with, you know, not having great vitamin D binding protein levels and not having great uh, vitamin D delivery. But what happens now when you start moving to South Dakota? Right? Or when you start moving even, even, even well north of the, the equator, these things start to play in, right? And they're, they're going to have an effect. And remember, these are genetics, so these are things that, we, that, uh, that we're born in. There's not a, not a lot of stuff we can do. So, so sort of the long and short of, of bringing up all this is, again, so we get back to this question, should we supplement? You know, the bottom line is, it, as, as, as most things in the human body, it's never quite as simple as it seems, right? We like to... And, and this is sort of the way we think, you know, sometimes we're kind of reductionist and it's nice to have specific mechanisms and this is doing that, but a lot of times it's a lot more complicated than we can give credit for. So does that mean we don't do anything and we paralyze? No, we just, we just need to understand what we're doing and, and, that, and that we keep on top of things like this. And there are, now if you look at supplements, there are certain brands of supplements, uh, particularly sort of the more natural type supplements, that will actually include K2 um, with if you give vitamin D, they might have a little bit of calcium, but they'll also have uh, K2 in there as well, too. So it's, um, it's, 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 it's being looked at. So should we supplement? I think yes. Right? I think if your level, I, I, do, I do agree with that. Um, I, I like to keep the uh, vitamin D level between, you know, somewhere above 30. I, sort of, I, I usually use about 30 to 50 as my range. Um, you know, it's, that's kind of more in line with the endocrine society recommendations because I think it does have physiologic effects. And I take, just for me personally, right, when I was, my level was 22, I was getting bad cramps and now it's, it's up higher, close to 40, and I'm doing fine. So, you know, I, I know that's a biased sort of view, but I think there's enough data that would support we ought to keep levels at a, at a reasonable level. So how much, how often, how to take it, D2 or D3, I, I, I won't really touch on this. I don't think it, for practical purposes, probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference. There are some subtle differences between D2 and D3, but it's okay. If they're getting it, I think that's all right. So the Endocrine Society guideline generally follow the IOM recommendations, but they say that higher daily intake of vitamin D supplements may be needed for individuals with deficiency. And I've seen this before because I've, I've actually used, I, I had a small private practice, which is odd for, for a picky doc, but um, but I used to do nutrition counseling a few times a month, and and so I've seen people with low vitamin D levels. You just can't if if they're low, if they're in the teens and they're a teenager or something, you can't get them up. I think unless you give higher doses or uh, over a prolonged time. So sometimes that's fifty thousand, you, you know, once a week. Sometimes you give them you know three, four, five thousand a day for several weeks, and then you can get them up into that thirty to forty range, and then you back down to a more of a, a maintenance uh, level. Um, and, and the important thing is you follow, right? I mean, even if, and, and, and the Endocrine Society actually says that in kids too, you can give them up to like 50,000 once a week. I tend to not be quite so bold if it's a smaller kid. Um, I might give a little bit less, uh, but the important thing is you follow them up. You don't just give it to them and say goodbye and then end up taking it forever. Okay, toxicity is a concern. High levels can cause hypercalcemia. Um, again, Endocrine Society says you get toxicity. You start worrying about toxicity at above 150, and they say up to 100 is safe in children and, and adults. If you're at that level, you don't really have to worry a whole lot. My, my, one of my sons, we used to keep a chewable vitamin Ds, and he's a teenager, she's kind of an idiot for doing this, but he liked the taste of it, and so he, and, and, and they're all kind of low chronically, but he decided he would take extra. And so he ended up with like a 120 something level, but actually clinically was fine, and we didn't really do much, and he sort of, uh, you know, probably not good long-term chronically, um, but he got a scolding, and. Um, and, and was told, but uh, you know, really nothing showed up, and his level dropped down nicely after not taking it for a while. Uh, toxicity typically only occurs with supplements, right, and also like sarcoid and other things that, uh, that that can happen. And it's important the settings of toxicity, basically. And I'll try to wrap up so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, extremely large doses, either in bolus or over long periods of time. The dose races, and this was a this was a, um, a risk of toxicity in pediatrics uh, and, um, from last year. Um, they were looking at dose ranges of about 240 to 4.5 million IUs. So these are massive doses, and they're resulting in huge 25-hydroxy uh, levels, hypercalcemia as well. And basically, you're looking at manufacturing errors. So the manufacturer has the, the wrong dosing in there, which does happen rarely. Intentional ingestion of high doses, accidental ingestion of high doses, like misreading labels, ink and drops. And this is important because there's a variety of vitamin D supplements, uh, particularly you know things like these over-the-counters, where you can have 400 IUs per ml or 400 IUs per drop, right, or 2,000 
IUs for ML or 2,000 IUs for drop, and then and if the if the family is getting the wrong dose or something. So you want to make sure that you know when you prescribe vitamin D that you're you're very specific about what they ask for, and and, and tell them you know to ask for you know the, they can ask for pharmacist help. You know, for a lot of infants, it's the the D Visol, which has the standard 400, and that's the, that's the easiest thing. But um, if you're doing it for for kids and teenagers, just just remember to be specific. Okay, so I will wrap up here. So vitamin D has a variety of effects in addition to its classical role in calcium hemostasis. And again, I, I put this, this term susceptibility, right? I think, I think that a lot of these are not sort of primary. It's not like if you're vitamin D deficient, you're going to get, you know, uh, allergic disease or autoimmune disease. But if you've got a genetic predisposition to it, you're probably more likely to develop it if you are vitamin D deficient as well, right? Same things like cancer and so forth. It's not that you're going to get cancer if you're vitamin D deficient, but if you have some sort of exposure or some sort of risk factor that's going to give you an increased risk of cancer, you, you, it may be more of an issue if you're vitamin D deficient. And again, it's common deficiency and insufficiency, really however you want to term it, and whatever you put your cutoff level, it's still pretty common. And due to a variety of factors, many people will need supplementation in order to achieve sufficient vitamin D levels. Uh, the dosing and appropriate target levels are, are being actively debated, but again, I sort of like that 30 to 50 kind of range as, a, as an a, a appropriate level. And then other factors, just keep in mind, right, vitamin K2, the vitamin D dining, binding protein, these are things that are going to modulate and affect vitamin D effects, and we're, we're still learning about that in, in the end. And so what do you do? I think if you eat good food and get sunlight, you're probably in the best shape, but if you need to take supplements, such it is. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes, it's actually con only controlled. It's actually not influenced at all by parathyroid. It's exclusively controlled by cytokines. Yeah, you know, it, it, it probably, I haven't seen a lot of data looking at that. Um, I, I, I would suspect yes. I would suspect that, yes, the, the, that anti-inflammatory cytokines would probably inhibit or might suppress. Or, you know, the other way it could be doing is that it could be dealing with completely different things and, and maybe, uh, you know, another sort of uh, binding element on the DNA that's going to be a more like a suppressor as opposed to a promoter. So that's the, the, other, the other thing, if it doesn't directly affect that. But I, I didn't see, I haven't seen specific data looking at that. Yeah, sure. Great talk. Oh, Great. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, two questions that you will not touch on 125 deep uh, dihydroxy in a world. I'm an immunodomalism. Most of people, yes, we know it's a major form, the D3, but the active form, 125. Right. And what is the things on, because people started measuring 125 rather than D3 and looking at the things and effect on a bone, particularly with osteopenia and a lot of things on because yes, you can have the adequate store of D3, but not enough of the biologically active form which you really need to have to make the things on. What's your comment? Yeah, usually, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively unusual to have that state. I don't know, have you seen it a lot? We don't do that thing on that, that's why, but there are a lot of people, in a research study, a lot of people now getting away from a 25, and go to 125 hydroxy D to just prove that yes, it's a biologic inactive form is missing or it's been deficient, even though. So more yeah. and more things are, it's been gearing towards that. You, you know, that's, that's kind of, tr I guess in some ways I can see that. You know, the issues with it are, are partly that, you know, there, there, there is turnover of that as well, too. Right, so even though it's a biologically active form, there's turnover. So I don't know what to make of that of that level. You know what I mean? Because it's it's it, it's something that, that that could you know you might need high levels at some point and lower levels at some point. There are going to be you know some sort of fluctuations. I mean, I don't even know. There could be daily fluctuations. There could be fluctuations based on specific needs at specific times. And that's why it's a hard level to to uh, to deal with and, and work with. I mean, I, I see the logic. Well, that's the active form. But the the problem is is that you know you don't know when you're measuring it and when it's going to be required and, and, and when it's needed, right? So I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that, I guess I would say. You know, certainly if, if you're looking at, 
you know, what we do know for now is that if you can maintain an, active, uh, an, an adequate level of the 25-hydroxy, that you can have enough bioavailability of the, of the, uh, of the, um, of the dihydroxy from, from conversion. Now, if there's a defect in the conversion or if there's a problem with conversion, then you're right, it might be, might be, might be troublesome. So, so, so I, don't, I don't know. I, I, can, I can sort of see that, but um, I think for most situations, it makes more sense to me to do the 25-hydroxy. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, my question is, I know you mentioned that vitamin D binding protein, there's a genetic predisposition maybe in dark skin individuals mm -hmm. for a deficiency of that. Have there been any studies, or do you know of familial tendencies to deficiencies, or have there been yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, a lot of these are familiar then, right? Because they're they're going to be they're going to be passed down. So different polymorphisms will, will be passed down. But it but it, it tends to be along it tends to be along ethnic lines, right? So you know, and, and there is more crossover now, obviously, in, in ethnic lines. So there's more variability. But it really tends to be so. So yes, it is familial. Um, and and are there the, the, there are a number? I think there's about there's about five polymorphisms that are pretty well. And have occurred at pretty reasonable frequency and are pretty well studied, and like uh, you know, one of them tends to be more commonly found in like African American communities. There is, uh, there is, um, and I think a similar one, if not related, uh, tends to be found in more Asian, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, population. But they can also have the normal ones as well too. So yes, it it it, it is it is familial, um, uh, and it tends to go along, uh, largely tends to go along ethnic lines, and sort of makes sense from that standpoint. Just from historically, where people came from. Yeah. All, right. All right. Thanks again. Thank